All right, good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us today. I'm gonna welcome everyone who's in attendance here in the room and also uh, the many people who are joining us online as well. Um, we're glad to have you here. My name is Catherine Warwick. I'm a faculty member in the political science department here at Villanova and a member of our Center for Arab and Islamic Studies. I'm also the editor of the Digest of Middle East Studies, one of the policy studies organization's journals. And it's policy studies organization and the journal that are sponsoring today's uh, conference. Uh, this is the annual Middle East Dialogue Conference that's run for many years, and it's the first time it's being hosted at Villanova. So we're really pleased to have it here in conjunction with the Center for Arab and Islamic Studies. Uh, the center director, Dr. Samuel Aboud, is not able to be with us today. He's on sabbatical, but he sends his greetings. Um, I also want to thank the center for its support for us and thank the political science department and the Albert LePage Center for History and the Public Interest, which is a a well-regarded center at Villanova that does a lot of um, public-oriented events on history. You should check their website for upcoming events. They always have wonderful things going on. Um, the Center for Arab and Islamic Studies was founded here at Villanova in 1983 by Father Kale Ellis, who is a, a politics scholar. Um, <laughs> since 1983, the center has been the home on campus for people who study uh, politics and theology and policy and language and literature and history of the Middle East. So it's a really good home for our journal here, uh, and we're, we're pleased to be here. So I'm here primarily in my role as editor of the Digest of Middle East Studies. The journal's purpose is primarily to feature high quality scholarship on a range of topics that are related to the Middle East. So we have recently published on everything from counterinsurgency to sign language policy and much more. And some of our participants who are uh, at the conference today have published with us in the past, and I hope more will do so in the future. Uh, I also say, look out for our special issue later this year on the woman life freedom protests and the implications for Iranian politics. We also have a session on Iranian politics here at the conference today. So now to move on to the more significant portion of, uh, of this session. I have the honor to introduce Dr. Alan ben Mayer, longtime scholar at NYU's Center for Global Affairs and a very long-standing associate and supporter of the Policy Studies Organization. Uh, Dr. Ben Mayer has very generously agreed to give the opening talk for today's conference. And so without further delay, I turn the proceedings okay. over to him. Uh, good morning. And thank you. Thank you, Paul, for having me, Danny. I just, uh, before I begin, I want to express my really profound thanks for Paul and, um, and Danny for making it almost uh, impossible to believe that I've been able to put this book together for that in a couple of months. And uh, I, again, I can't thank you enough. And I want to thank my right arm assistant who came sitting there. We we'll work with, with, with work on it. I don't know, a whole day and night just to make sure every comma is there and every full stop is there. And thank you so much, Kim, for that as well. You know, I have been a, a student of the Middle East practically since I graduated, going back nearly 50 years ago. And and uh, even then, when I was actually my PhD about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, then I said the only solution is a two-state solution. There is simply no other solution. And what we are, what we have witnessed now, in the, you know, this attack of October seven, have defied very many beliefs or uh, views that a the occupation is sustainable. Well, the occupation has never been sustainable, and will never be sustainable. Then they have Israelis and Palestinians who maintain that there is no way to establish a two-state solution. And I think these events in the last six, seven months has shown again that there is in fact no solution other than two-state solution. And otherwise there is absolutely no way you can satisfy the Palestinian requirement to be independent and have a state of their own. The event of the last six months also have shown that Israeli government, specifically those who are leading to the right of center, and the Palestinians who are extremists, such as Hamas, have been really in, you know, engaged in a pipe dreams about the future 
of the region and the future of their relationship. And they too, as a result of what happened in the last seven months since October 7, have also come to the conclusion, albeit they are not willing to admit it yet. And I can tell you from my conversation with them, with many, they understand there is a point, no point of return at this point. That is, what happened October 7, which is the most horrific, horrifying attack on Israeli civilians, where 1,200 been slaughtered, and then Israel's subsequent invasion of Gaza that so far resulted, just imagine, 33,000 dead. Nearly half, half of Gaza infrastructure been destroyed. But the most painful thing is 25,000 of those who did are children, women and children. Not having ever in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has such a tragedy and, you know, uh, evolved in front of our eyes. And still, and still to this very moment as we speak, the war is raging, and the government, the Netanyahu government, has not as yet not shown any sign of willing to compromise and come to the realization that whether or not Hamas is overwhelmed, whether or not Hamas eventually ceases to exist as a political organization, because I do not believe that Hamas will ever be eliminated. <laughs> because even if you eliminate Hamas in Gaza, which is impossible, still you have strong, they have strong presence in the West Bank. Very strong presence. So Hamas may not be a major political movement, and that is, again, a stretch, but they will always exist in the West Bank as well as in Gaza. So Israelis, in thinking in terms of the future, they need to understand that the Palestinian needs, the Palestinian requirement, the Palestinian aspiration for a state of their own is not something that they can, Israel can negotiate. It, took, it, it can take another 75, 76 years, and the, Israel, the Palestinians will never, never give up their right to a state. And then this is not a speculation on my part. I mean, I spent all these decades I've known the Israelis and the Palestinians inside out. I lived within this community. And, and to, to me, to, to, to see people still to this day thinking that it is, that they can sustain what existed in the last 57 years of occupation, they have simply do not understand the mindset of the Israelis and the Palestinians. That is, they do not also understand the psychological dimension of the conflict. And it has many other dimensions. It has the religious dimension. It has the other ideological dimension. It has the obviously territorial dimension. It has elements that it is in the mind. But no one, really, if you look at the effort all these years to reconcile between the two sides, there was hardly any effort to reconcile the psychological dimension of the conflict. So even you can sit down and negotiate about territory and exchange of territories. There's been agreement, such as say happened at the Oslo Accord in 1993-1994. Eventually, it did not lead to a statehood, no matter what happened. So look at the, we look at the last, you know, 57 years. There were negotiations, there were mediations, conferences, international conferences all over. Pressure sometimes exerted from the United States and other parties persuasion, all these efforts eventually led to nothing, practically nothing. And the result, what we've seen seven, nearly seven months ago, it is, to me, it is not, was not as startling at all. I, I just like to, to share with you a, a, pass, a, a, a paragraph. Um, excuse me a second. Um, a paragraph that I wrote and I put it in this book because it's the part of the introduction. And this was in September of 2022, which is a year, or a little over a year, when I wrote this particular essay. I was, in fact, in Jordan. And I left Israel on the 6th. I ended up in Jordan on the 7th, the day of the attack. And on the 9th, I wrote this piece. Uh, I mean... Uh, 
a year before that, I wrote this, this article, but I wrote a piece. Also, I quoted this piece in the article that I wrote on September, on October 9th of, of, the, of last year. And here what I said, the danger that all concerned parties seem to overlook is that although on the surface, the status quo between Israel and the Palestinian may prevail for a little longer, say three to four years, it cannot be sustained uh, for much beyond that. It is bound to explode in the face of everyone who does not realize the urgency and the dire consequences in the absence of a solution. Indeed, it is not a matter of if, but when, the Palestinians will rise and resort to violence, making the second intifada in 2002, in 2000, looks like a mere rehearsal. And the Israelis who have been living in the denial will sooner rather than later have to face the bitter truth. The Palestinian problem will not go away. It will continue to haunt them and offer no respite. Moreover, the conflict with the Palestinian will continue to provide Israel's staunchest enemy, Iran, and its proxies, Hezbollah in Lebanon, the perfect recipe. They need to destabilize the region and constantly threaten Israel's national security. And Whereas Israel can prevail militarily over any of its enemies, albeit an increasing, increasing toll in blood and pressure, it cannot stop the most dangerous threat of all, the deadly erosion resulting from its continuing brutal occupation of that moral foundation on which the country was established. But that was over more than a year before October 7th. Now, I am not suggesting to you I'm a prophet or I could just predict the future. This was, my assessment was based on what I was looking at. I was watching the, the West Bank. I was watching the, the Israelis, you know, right, right, you know, what they've been doing in the West Bank in terms of, you know, arbitrary, I said, detention, uprooting of trees, uh, creeping annexation, settlers' harassment. And so on and so on. I mean, this being going day in there. And I'm saying to myself, to the Israelis, friends, I say, what do you think is going to happen? This cannot continue because it's a question of time when there's going to be another major explosion. Exactly what I thought. Again, only based on what I was reviewing and saying. What has changed since October 7th? And this is what I've been really preaching and talking, and this is basically the basis of this book. What happened in October 7 has created a completely new dimension to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. That is, it will be impossible, and I repeat that, it will be impossible to go back to the status quo ante that existed before October 7. That is no matter what Israel does today, no matter what the Palestinians do, no matter what the United States steps measures would take, we cannot go back to the, before the October 7th. Something has dramatically changed, and the all parties concerned are going to have to come to single simple conclusion. The two-state solution came back to the, at the table. This is what I said then, and I'm repeating now. Came back, to, to basically to hunt both sides. So those Palestinians like Hamas, who wanted all of it, all of, all of former Palestine, or the Israelis who wanted the greater Israel, have now have to, to realize again that what happened amended all these thoughts and ideas, albeit public, they will still stick to the, to the notion that they can have it all. It just will not come to happen. So what is... Whereas in the past, all these efforts, negotiation, conferences, mediation, known and on, did not work. What was missing sometime in conflict resolution? Sometime you need to change the dynamics of the conflict from the very foundation. And that often takes an explosion. That is an explosion of such magnitude that shakes the foundation of the conflict. And this is what happened on October 7th and the massive Israeli retaliation. 
They have shaken the entire foundation of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and it created a new element that has to be, we have to deal with today. And this is, to me, there was major break, major breakdown in the relationship between the two sides. Just imagine, between the two sides after 76 years, the relation today between the, both, both, both sides are the worst that it has been in more than seven decades. So this is a major, major breakdown. But to me, when I look at being involved in conflict resolution, to me, a breakdown could indeed offer a major breakthrough. And this is the focus of what I've been preaching since October 7 and beyond, I mean, and since then. That is, there is an opportunity for a breakthrough. The question is, can it be pursued? Who is going to pursue that? And we have to look around and see what's going on in Israel, what's going on in the Palestinian Authority, what's going on in the United States. The United States had been supporting a two-state solution, but they have really successive administration basically paid nothing but a lip service to the state solution. They hardly any administration put any pressure on Israel to actually move in the direction of a two-state. And they allow Israel, with some artificial criticism, to expand the settlement, building more and more settlement. Today, you have nearly 700,000 settlers in East Jerusalem and in the West Bank. This is a fact. It is no longer reversible. Then, of course, you have the, the Israelis. Also, they're looking at many Israelis also talk about two state solution. But they were well mainly, you know, since the people like Netanyahu and his company who's been in power roughly the last 16 years, feeling very confident that if we sustain the occupation for 57 years, we can keep it for another 57 years and so. But the pressure in Israel today, albeit they are not going demonstrations by the hundreds of thousands, which they should have, just like they went out to demonstrate against the judicial reform, they're slowly coming to realize, okay, where do we go from here? And so the same sentiment is being is evolving among the Palestinians. So what, what we have today is a, is a the change has taken place. The question is, do you have the leadership, the leadership to realize that this change has taken place? How shall we capitalize on it? And when I see President Biden now putting more and more pressure on Israel, it's certainly overdue. But he needs to do quite a bit more. The relationship today between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu is the worst that could be possibly imagined. And so the two simply do not see eye to eye. But to have a change other than leadership, you're going to deal on something else. The current Israeli government must go. Must go. And it will go. And the Palestinian Authority, in with the West Bank, will also have to go under Mahmoud Abbas. That is, in order to move toward two-state solution, you have to create a new Palestinian authority, and I don't think this is far-fetched at all. We talk, they're talking about it. There's a pressure on Mahmoud Abbas. This got to be done. A new Palestinian authority that is more realistic, that can see where the future, what's going to happen. And then in Israel, anyone who's been following what's going on in Israel today will tell you. The polls are very clear. Netanyahu's popularity has sunk to the lowest in his history as a, as a, as a political leader. And there clear demand, as we speak, yes, last week, major demonstrations in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv demanding a new election. So there is a movement. Things are evolving, developing. And the question now, how far we, that is, it's got to be far greater pressure from the United States, far greater pressure from Israelis, and certainly within the Palestinian community. So there's always, of course, the question is going to be, what will be the story? What will be, what will happen to Hamas? Now, I, wishful thinking, there may be some, there's an element of wishful thinking involved here. But my feeling is that 
given what is happening today, Israel simply cannot leave Gaza and go back to what happened, back to the blockade. That was a disaster. A disaster for the Palestinians. Just imagine 2.2 million, basically they were living in a concentration camp. That's what's been happening. So that condition in Gaza need to change. So it, it is inconceivable to just leave and restore the blockade. So this, so what, what we do with Hamas, if Hamas uh, military capability is reduced to uh, no longer effective, they will still remain a political organization, as I said earlier, which means any peace solution, any effort to reach an agreement will have to account for the fact that there is an element of extremists within the Palestinian, like Islamic Jihad, like, like Hamas, they also need to be politically accommodated. And the Israelis to this day, it's for them, it's inconceivable. How do we, how can you do that with Hamas? And of course, many of Israelis forget and you know, Hamas horrific, unforgivable attack was not, did not happen in vacuum. Did not happen in vacuum. 18 years of blockade that made the life of so many, 2 million plus miserable, 57 of occupation in the West Bank. For every Palestinian that Israel killed over these years, four or five were born with the, with the objective, we will revenge, we want revenge. When they went to Gaza, many soldiers would say, I want my revenge. This is where we are today. So the then. The question is, like I said before, there is an opportunity that we need to capitalize on. And let me very briefly, because I will need, I will adhere to the time limits because I'd like to have some questions from you. In, before, the, before the October 7, there were indirect negotiations between Israel and Saudi Arabia, Israel seeking normalization of relations with Saudi Arabia. But the Saudis were more somewhat compromising. They wanted some kind of a Palestinian entity that is to be an integral part of any agreement with Israel in terms of normalization. And there were these negotiations going far, rather seriously. But after the event of October 7, the, the, the Saudis now insist not just some kind of entity, Palestinian entity, with not necessarily full-fledged state, but now they are saying, if you want normalization of relations, you have to have a completely free, independent Palestinian state as a prerequisite to normalization of relations. But we have also to understand that the implication of normalization of relations with Saudi Arabia. If Saudis are going to do that, I can tell you just about every single Arab state will follow, with the exception of maybe one or two. And probably 90% of the Muslim state will follow. And the Israelis know that. Netanyahu knows that. But from him, you know, for him for a long while, he was relating to, to Hamas as a, in a ragtag organization with some firecrackers. That's how he referred to them. And of course, they have proven to be a formidable, formidable political force. I did not want to, you know, go over how is it possible that they built 400 mile longer tunnels, more than all of the New York City subway. What happened to the Israeli intelligence? How could Netanyahu possibly ignore that? If he knew and did nothing about it, he should have resigned. If he didn't know, he should have resigned. He should have known. Prime Minister must assume responsibility. But he's a coward. He's facing three criminal charges. He knows that once the war is over, he's going to be facing a commission of inquiry. He knows that. I know that. The whole, all of Israel knows that. And so what is tragic is happening, he would be deliberately prolonging the war. And I'm not just alone by me or saying that. I'm, talk to scores and scores of people in the know, in Israel and outside. And they will say, absolutely. This guy, 
need to exonerate himself, and he will stop short of nothing until he sort of reach a complete and total victory, which is an illusion, other than allowing Hamas in one form or another to be a part and parcel of any future agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. But Israel wants, under Hamas, under Netanyahu, anyone else, would like to establish normalized relations with Saudi Arabia. It's a key. This will open, just imagine what, how much Israel will gain if such normalization took place. So it's hard to imagine. That is, Israel dreams of being a major power, but it's a peaceful with a kind of outreach with its technology, with its achievement. Israel will not be the same. So they want normalization of relationship, but they're not prepared to pay the price. So my suggestion here you know, in this particular book is that the United States ought to take somewhat different track. And I think people in the White House are listening, not necessarily to me, but listening to this pretty much message. The United States, President Biden, Hopefully he will be re-elected. I don't believe he'll be able to do so, albeit when I wrote this, I was saying early January that possibly he can still do that without, he can start the process, and even if he cannot complete it, he can continue next, next uh, after the election. And even if he doesn't win, and God forbid, I hope that I'm a Republican here, uh, Trump come back, Trump would not want to miss the opportunity if there's uh, something on the table that can be realized, he would like to realize it and take all the credit. That's Trump. But at this juncture, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that Biden may not want to do that. But nevertheless, the approach is this. United States with Saudi Arabia need to go over the head of, of the Palestinians as well as the Israelis and say the following. Time has come. This has to come from the United States. Time has come and the Saudis. Time has come to end this endemic, horrifying, disastrous, tragic conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. Because there is no other outlet. There is no other solution. A two-state solution is the only solution. And those who speak about one state, they really, honestly, they do not know what they're talking about. Because such a state cannot be democratic. Israel, in no time, will be ruled by Palestinians. Because if you put the number of Palestinians living in the West Bank and Gaza and in Israel proper, they are more practically the same. Today, they are more or less the same number of Jews in Israel. In less than two years, there will be a majority. So for the Israelis, they will never think in terms of one state solution because that means giving up the Zionist dream. That's not going to happen. Israeli would like one state solution based on the current reality. Yes, we have one state. The Palestinians will be second class citizens. They'll be under control. And we can have two, two the political system. One is democracy and the other one is authoritarian. That's what the Israelis would like to see. And the Palestinians are not settling for anything less either. Along, along with the Saudis and other Arab countries were proposing complete autonomy but not total independence, because they say, no, we deserve this as our land, and we have to have our independence as well. So the two-state solution, the one-state solution basically is being rolled out, and now the opportunity presents itself. Once we remove the obstacle, we remove the Netanyahu government, which will leave, I can tell you this, Netanyahu government will not last, probably not beyond 2024. And Mahmoud Abbas has been told time and again by the United States, it's time to change. You're going to have to have a new election. You have to prepare for that. The question what remains, under what condition Israel is going to leave the West Bank, the Gaza? And here, really, Israel doesn't have too many options. Netanyahu is talking about the absurd, the absolute absurdity. That is, that uh, will maintain control over Gaza again. And some even in the government they are proposing to build a new settlement. That is the, the height of madness. Just imagine Israel being suffering so much. Israelis, what's going on in the West Bank? Let alone now you add, add Gaza again and, and occupy Gaza again. So this is simply not going to happen. 
So, but Netanyahu needs to make that decision. But if he doesn't make the right decision, the pressure on him internally and domestically, as well from the international community, is mounting day in and day out. That solution has to be found. And the only way is for Israeli to eventually withdraw. Gradually, an international peace force will be formed. Another international commission that can deal with the, with the Gaza will have to be formed. This is not, not just ideas. I have checked into that. The possibilities are there. It can happen. It should happen. And within a period of 18 months to two years, you know, Israel complete, Israeli forces will completely withdraw from there. And then during this period, the Palestinians will be preparing to election. And there will be a new Palestinian authority provided, again, I emphasize this, Hamas, whatever the remnant of Hamas, the fighters, they, they have to be considered as a part and parcel. Because they too now have come to the conclusion that their aspiration to destroy Israel, it is no longer possible. In fact, I don't believe they ever believed that to begin with. So the opportunity now presents itself. Once we remove these two, these obstacles, then as far as the solution itself is concerned, we can talk about that because can you really remove all the settlements? That's going to happen. Can you really divide Jerusalem? That's not going to happen. Can you, can you, can Israel um, uh, compromise on its national security? That's not going to happen. But all of this, we have a solution. We have a solution, practical solution. I'm happy to, uh, to answer this question. Practical solution. That all of the conflicting issues can be resolved, provided also you deal with the psychological dimension of the conflict. You have to sit down and talk about the different historic narrative. They need to reconcile that. They need to talk about it ideologically. Israel wants us all the Palestinians wants us to talk about the Zionist ideas versus the Palestinians. So this mind reconciliation ought to ought to be also part and parcel. For that, for that reason, I'm advocating a period of reconciliation. That you need a period of reconciliation along with the political progress. You have to have a reconciliation between the two people, the people, and government to government to begin mitigating the psychological impediment between the two sides. That is essential. And under no circumstances, we can simply sit down and reach an agreement, having experienced the horror of the last 75, 76 years. It just won't happen. There's intense distrust, there's intense hatred between the two sides. And basically, they want to get rid of each other because they both have the same claim to the same land. So we need to mitigate the historical perspective, the, the religious as well. All of that needs to be spoken about because there is a solution to deal with all of these conflicting issues. So my I'm, I'm, people always accuse me of being too optimist. Well, um, after 40 years of dealing with this, <laughs> And I have never given up because with all humility, I think I know what human nature is all about. And we also look at history, conflict in history. Some of them lasted centuries. But in the end, in the end, they come to realize that there is no other way. That is Israeli coexistence, a Palestinian Israeli coexistence, is not something you can change. Either they can coexist and kill each other for another 75 years, or coexist and fight, have peace between the two sides. But they cannot get rid of coexistence because neither the Israelis can get rid of the Palestinians, nor the Palestinians can get rid of the Israelis. And no one can argue again on that. So which basically it's suggested here, yes, since you coexist and there is no way out, do you want to kill each other for another 75 years? Do you have another October 7th? Do you have another third intifada? Do you have another invasion? Or are you going to reconcile yourself and sit down and, re and realize coexistence is irreversible? We are stuck. We might as well begin to look at each other's eye and say, let's find a solution. Thank you.
Absolutely. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. I wanted to adhere to the time. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, then. How do you see um, internal domestic Israeli politics in terms of the possibility not just to remove Netanyahu, but to find an alternative to this right wing stream that Netanyahu represents? Do you think Israeli society in general might move uh, towards an alternative? Or how do you see it? Well, uh, we've been watching the polls taken recently in the last year, and consistently, <laughs> consistently, once the Netanyahu government, the Netanyahu government will lose, the opposition will gain roughly 67 mandate out of 120 in the Israeli parliament. This is the sentiment today. And it's not changing. The person people of Israelis are looking at to be the prime minister is Gans, the former chief of staff of the Israeli army. He is certainly prepared. He is the most popular today in Israel. And there's no question, the Ben Gvir and the Smurids are those madmen, completely madmen, fascist for that matter. They cannot be, they cannot be in any government, not now, not ever again. So yes, in Israel, there is a significant movement saying enough is enough. Not necessarily talking, okay, let's give him this and give him that, but they, they want to end the conflict. But they also know it's not going to end by simply making tiny concession to the Palestinians, considering any more than that. It seems to me, you describe yourself as an optimist, and we agree this is a, a lovely and practically optimistic view. Um, I wonder if, in terms of what you're saying about the solution, uh, possible solutions to the conflict, you're, you're talking very much in the language of transitional justice. And so transitional justice has a whole range of tools that can be brought to bear in conflicts like this. And I was really interested that you were stressing the psychological aspects, the need to bring Hamas into the process. And I wonder what you think about transitional justice tools like war crimes trials um, and this element that, that quite popularly thought of punishment of most of the wrongdoings by any party. Do you think that's a possibility here? Would you value them? Well, you know, we, we thought in terms of is there any way to sort of transitional justice? Well, I'm more inclined to believe of what Mandela has done, peace and reconciliation. That is, if you start a process of revenge and retribution and put people on trial, well, you're going to start another major confrontation that you want to avoid. So injustices absolutely took place all along. But if you want to rectify justice, you are going to sacrifice the potentially the process, a peaceful process. So I, I would I would follow what Mandela has done, say, you know, we're not gonna deal with we're not gonna go take into retribution and, and revenge against the white, because we need peace and reconciliation, and that is exactly what needs to happen in Israel, in my view. We also have some questions from the online participants. I don't know if you can see these on the screen that you might want to answer. Maybe want to read it. I can read them for you. Um, we have a question from the audience from uh, Mark Brzezonski. He's saying, if and when there is a Palestinian state, where will it be? And what about the long UN established right of return for Palestinians? Will the million of refugees in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and beyond be freely allowed to visit, to invest and build businesses, to freely travel, to come back if they want to live in Palestine and come and go freely without Israeli restrictions? Excellent questions, and I have addressed this many times in the past. There is, there is no doubt that is where the Palestinian state will be, obviously in the current West Bank and Gaza, but there are Israeli settlements. But remember this, Israeli settlements do not occupy more than 7% of the landmass of the West Bank today. That's just a fact. And we've been talking for years about land swap which means the Palestinian will need to do some kind of land swap. Israelis, not every settlement is going to stay, but the three major blocks, 
of settlement, which comes, which have 80% of the settlers will have to stay in place. The Palestinian, mind you, in previous negotiations have agreed to that against Lenswa. When 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 Olmert was negotiating with them, 8,000 8, 8, and 8 and 9, they pretty much agreed, except the dispute between the two. So what was the percentage of the Lenswa? That was really destroyed the negotiations then. He wanted 6, 7%. The Palestinian insisted on no more than 2, 3%. He wanted an opportunity to expand the settlement, the, the three blocks. But many some of the scattered small settlements will have to move to the larger settlement in order to allow for contiguous land mass for the Palestinian state and not having blockades every 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 uh, two three miles ago. And mind you, this has been discussed before, and there was basically an agreement in principle about the land swap situation. As to the refugees. Some have wistful thinking. Well, let's see. Some of them can go back to their original. Well, I must tell you, I wish this is possible, but it will not happen. It just won't happen. But they have every right to be fully compensated or resettled, or both. Which means if there is going to be a Palestinian state, the United States, the EU, the Arab state, England as well as Israel, will have to provide the funding and I, again, I wrote in many pieces on this subject, the pride of funding to allow these Palestinian who wants to return back to their home to be able to do so by providing them housing and opportunities for jobs and, and, and education and health care. That is absolutely possible, absolutely necessary, and it will happen under conditions of peace. There's no question about it. So how many will in fact decide to move from Jordan back to the West Bank or from Syria or from Lebanon? Some, uh, the, the, the most known and respected um, pollster, uh, 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 Khalid Kukali, is it? Not Kukali. Shikaki, uh, Shikaki. Uh, took many polls. How many would be actually want to return? He found it with the only 10, 15% maximum. Yes. As a matter of fact, he was chastised and threatened because he published the results <laughs> at the time. So this is the solution. The solution is there. And, you know, one more moment, more, it's important point to be, make, be, to be made. There are many Palestinians that are in refugee camps in the West Bank and Gaza. Well, to me, they're, they're considered refugees. Well, they're you know, technically speaking, practically speaking, they are not refugees. They are, in dis in, you know, displaced in their country, in their territory. They are displaced. So again, these de deserve better housing, better education, because they are internally displaced. They haven't left Palestine. They would just move from one place to another. So they need to be also compensated and dealt with so that you eliminate the stigma of refugee camps. And I'm sorry to say, you know, the Arab state for decades did not want to solve this, this Palestinian refugee problem because that was a card that they want to use against Israel all along. And then sadly, they prolonged the Palestinian refugee problem. But today we're facing, an, facing a different reality and the solution is right there, it's waiting, but the move has to start with both sides coming to realization that this is a crossroad. We have no choice but to face each other and begin a new era between the two sides. We have uh, another question from Zoom from uh, Amadula Farahat. If we consider the two-state solution the practical one, how can we save the Middle East region from the danger of an apartheid state that has mass destruction weapons, how can it be reformed into a peaceful and pluralistic state? If, 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 if the question is in reference to Israel, I suppose. Well, you know, um, you have to, Israel today under this current Netanyahu government, it's, a, it's a, the most horrifying government that's ever established in the history of the state of Israel. So any future government is going to have to be more moderate government and they understand the reality. Israel is a powerful country then, today, and it will be more, even more powerful 
in years to come. What they have created is de facto an apartheid state. Yes, that has to change, has to change. And that is why the only way you can change that is by having independent Palestinian state. Nothing short of that. Or else, what will be the story of Israel? I'm just finished a piece of writing about Netanyahu. If no change such as this, has this created a pariah state, an apartheid state? This will have to live by the sword indefinitely. That just cannot happen. It should not happen. And the international community must oppose that with every tool and means by which they can do so. Doesn't look like we have any more questions here. So if there are no more questions out here, I think we can end this session. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.